Hello, everyone, and welcome to APS Webinars. The title of today's webinar is Talking Shop, Communicating Science in Private Industry, the fourth in our Success in Industry Careers series. I'm Crystal Bailey, and I'll be your host for today's broadcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, APS Webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students, working physicists, and educators. Can we advance the slide, please? All right, thank you. Um, why become an APS member? APS membership gives you easy access to valuable career information and resources like this webinar. And it allows you to get your research out to the community and network with, with potential employers or colleagues at our meetings and have a greater positive impact about issues that are important to you through grassroots advocacy. It can also help you help connect you with a community of like-minded folks through participation in our forums, divisions, and topical groups. If you are not yet an APS member but value the things that APS provides, we do encourage you to consider joining today. And there's the URL if you want to learn more about how to join APS. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, we'll introduce our speaker in just a second, but I do want to do a little bit of housekeeping. I'll kick off the discussion today with a few prepared questions, uh, and then Marciano will give his presentation, and then I will kick off the Q&A with a few prepared questions, and then we'll open the floor to all the Q&A that comes in from the audience. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the questions panel located on the right side of your screen. You should see a GoToWebinar panel and there's a questions box. That's where you submit your questions. You can submit them at any point during the webinar, um, during the presentation, during the discussion, and we will do our best to uh, fold those into the discussion and get those answered for you. Um, also notice that there's the little orange arrow in the um, upper left-hand side of that panel. So you can use that to toggle uh, open and close the uh, GoToWebinar panel. You can also uh, adjust your audio settings. Uh, you can choose mic, mic and speakers or telephone. Um, also, I will uh, note that it is being recorded. The session is being recorded and it, the link to the recording will be sent to you by email. Uh, but we do ask that you give us 48 hours to prepare that video and uh, get that ready to, to send out to you all. But, you will get a link to the recording in about two days. <laughs> um, okay, um, lastly, I also wanna mention that we do have a survey that we'll launch at the end of this webinar. We would greatly appreciate it if you would take a moment to answer a couple questions and help us um, improve our ability to provide you with these valuable services. Next slide, please. And lastly, before we dive in, I do want to mention the next broadcast we have coming up in the series, Teamwork in Industry. It'll be on Tuesday, November 17th. In that webinar, Matthew Thompson, who is chair-elect of the APS Forum on Industrial and Applied Physics and himself an applied physicist uh, in industry, uh, will break down the importance of teamwork, how the size of an organization alters what teamwork looks like, and how it gets judged when performance review time comes. Matt will also provide concrete suggestions on building up your teamwork skill set before your next job search. We also have a webinar coming up in just a couple of days as part of the Physics Career Exploration Series um, about careers in medical physics uh, featuring Dr. Julianne Pollard-Larkin. She is an amazing speaker. She's really warm, um, fun uh, speaker. I encourage you to tune into that to learn more about medical physics careers. Uh, you don't want to miss the great discussion, so if you haven't done so, please sign up for our main webinars mailing list. The link at the bottom of the page will take you there, and if, if you sign up, it gives you the opportunity to sign up for different series that we're offering, such as this one, the Success in Industry Careers, Physics Career Exploration, and other topics. So please sign up for our webinars if you have not done so already. All right, next slide. Okay, now I get to introduce our wonderful speaker. Uh, Marciano Bagnoli is a scientist and manager at Georgia Pacific, where he oversees continuous improvement projects. He has previously localized cosmetic and thermal interface material production lines from Japan to the United States. 
Marciano has also served as a consultant to help small businesses in Germany access international projects throughout the European Union and award grants to innovative startup companies. In addition, he designs, equips, and staffs laboratories to ensure the products produced meet strict domestic and international quality standards. And with that, I will stop talking and turn things over to you, Marciano. Thanks, Crystal. All right. Good day, everybody. So wonderful to be with you here today. And we're uh, going to talk about communication and industry. So like Crystal mentioned, um, uh, my career spanned several locations throughout North America, Asia, and Europe. And after, to kind of start from the beginning, I graduated from the University of Mount Union with my degree in physics and personally didn't really know what I wanted to do. Then the universe kind of decided for me and I ended up taking a job as a consultant in Europe doing the work with startup companies. And I found out that oftentimes in that setting, you'd end up com uh, communicating not in your native language. So it became very, very important to understand what the other party wanted to ensure that the discussions went well so we could form these partnerships. That only became more and more evident working to localize production lines from Japan where now instead of not only not being able to speak the other language, you also can't read typically. So if the importance of communication only gets higher with the larger complexity of products and as our world becomes more and more interactive and interdisciplinary, knowing how to present your ideas to a forum becomes ever, ever more important. So we're gonna talk about communication kind of as an overview to see what it looks like to exchange ideas in an in industrial setting. We're also gonna take a look at methods, uh, how we talk about ideas. So communication is the ability to exchange these ideas or methods or how we exchange them. Sometimes those are through slides, sometimes those are through talks, sometimes those are through webinars like we're doing today, and very often it will also be written. So we'll take a look at those. And then finally, we'll kind of paint some pictures about some scenarios that you may encounter throughout your, your careers in industry, should you decide to go that route, and kind of the unique challenges that these scenarios can maybe uh, present for you that you might not be used to. Uh, one thing to keep in mind as we talk about a lot of these is that this is a, these are more principles rather than processes. So this isn't necessarily something where you have to do all of the steps. Maybe only one of them is needed to get you the job or get your proposal funded. But uh, combining and leveraging all of these tools and having them in your toolbox, the more you use them, the more you'll recognize when you might need to use one or the other or maybe all of them to make sure that your idea gets to where it needs to go. So this is, to start off with communication, uh, one thing that's interesting in private industry is that you need typically a lot of buy-in from other stakeholders. So these can be people that are not necessarily your boss. These can be people in other different departments. So oftentimes during localizations, your ideas will not only need to be cleared by your R&D department, you also need to get engineering buy-in, you need to get purchasing buy-in, you need to get sourcing buy-in, you need to understand where the money's coming from, so you have to talk with accounting. And very often, any one of these steps can cause you trip-ups. And you don't want that to happen because you don't want the project to slow down. But that's a little bit un unusual and can be different from coming from academia, where typically there's only kind of one audience that you're talking with, and typically that audience is very familiar with the science that you're uh, trying to communicate. Whereas in industry, very often the people you're talking to don't really understand and often don't really need to fully understand the work that you're doing as a scientist in order to get the project on the road. Which leads us kind of to the next thing is that the outcomes of your work and the points that you're trying to present, while those may be very compelling to you or to other technically minded people, that may not be evident to the person that you're speaking with. They might not see the importance of choosing one instrument over the other or the ergonomics of having the laboratory set up in the way that it is. So keeping that in mind, you need to understand where the other person is coming from to know what information you need to give them and kind of 
preempt any questions that you might have. You know, why are you choosing the instrument that's twice the price? Well, obviously, as anybody knows in your field, that that's the one that you have to use. But from someone from an accounting perspective, it tells a very different story. And heading those discussions off early can be really important. And there's some cases where uh, data doesn't do all the talking for you. Whereas in science, if there's data, your ideas immediately have ground and immediately powerful. Very often in industry, data only does so much of the convincing. Stories and advocacy go a lot farther in convincing people who maybe don't have as uh, technical of a background and knowing how to frame the data and how to contextualize it can be just as important as the data itself because you can have a fantastic idea but if other people don't see the buy-in and don't see why they should care oftentimes they won't because everybody's really busy and that kind of leads to an unfortunate reality which is very oftentimes in industry you will be judged by your ability to speak and your ability to write over your intelligence or the, or the quality of your ideas and there's a lot of opinions people have about this but very often normally great scientists can face unreasonable opposition that could be cleared up immediately by good communication and understanding what the other person needs to know in order to act on those ideas and by combining those sorts of skills and strong scientific and uh, practices and good data you can get fantastic outcomes. The folks that can combine the scientific skills and the communication skills oftentimes end up as the director of laboratories, doing the outreach, getting the funding to get the project together. So not only is it successful for your career, but also these are the ideas that get funded and get implemented into society. So with a combination of communication and science, both you and society as a general, whether that's the organization, whether it's the nonprofit, whether it's the uh, governmental policy, however that works, Great outcomes happen from that men, from that melding. When you do this, the first thing you want to do is listen. You need to understand who your audience is before you jump in and start unloading information at them. Never hurts to talk with the people that you'll be pitching an idea to or understanding where your boss is coming from or where your coworkers are. So that way you know what their goals are. Why should they care about your idea? And how does it help them? complete their goals. What, make, what about that makes their job easier? Or what about them helps um, move the organization forward? Because once again, it may not be evident to the casual observer. This can be uh, talking about moving from one vendor to another. Well, that's a lot of work for a purchasing department, but for you, you could save you know, several percentage points on your lab consumable uh, budgets by moving. So by showing that cost, it's a pretty simple example, but it, it's something I've done and it has happened. And then it can get even more complicated when, oh no, we have a supplier agreement or, you know, maybe the real issue with you isn't price, maybe it's actually delivery time. So highlighting those ideas and understanding that those goals are important to you. And while recognizing that making sure it's a holistic solution for the purchasing department can make things go easier. Understanding how the other person views the world is important too in terms of just where what are their are their departments geared towards very often accounting and purchasing firms are very focused on the p l and tax ideas that surround it where that really doesn't come into play as an r d person in a quality environment or really in an engineering environment so having those ideas and having those kind of flags apparent to you before you go and start talking to them and you know really rushing them along a project can really help you out and smooth things, uh, smooth things out and seeing how they define success in their roles. So that way you can both kind of agree on a mutual idea of what success looks like for the organization and for your partnership. Because communication is an exchange of ideas, right? So making sure that everybody's getting what they need from that exchange is important. Which follows up with the idea that whenever you're talking in industry, unlike in academia, Everything that you say leads to an action. Whereas you're very rarely will you be speaking solely to inform or solely to expose ideas. Oftentimes when you're communicating, you're communicating because you want the other person to do something. So 
when you do that, you need to understand when you're about to tell someone something, how are they gonna use this information? What are they gonna do to act on it? And how does that forward the project or the organization? Because very often I've seen scientists start talking about methods, or start speaking on uh, how they got to a result. In reality, the person on the other side, very often it doesn't matter to them. They need to know what to do with that information. That's what they. That's what needs to be conveyed. So, understanding that every time you communicate and participate in this exchange with the other person, you need to make sure that not only are they giving them information that they care about, but that they can go and act on that information in a way that's beneficial to the pair of you. Not only in your own pairing, but also to the organization as a whole. Right. As you go through this, you may find that you encounter oversharers, right? People who are talking about uh, every single thing that they did on their project when the audience maybe couldn't care less. And in those instances, you find out that people who are broadcasting that, not only do they find the information not helpful, those folks end up developing a reputation for not having valuable content, and they end up being tuned out for better or for worse, right? And that's something you definitely don't want to have happen because if you're found as you go up in your in your careers and as you you know maybe you approach project leadership or maybe you get into management if you're found to be someone who just uh, excuse me displays unneeded or unrequested information just that nobody can use or that nobody cares about very often you'll find yourself being put kind of in the background and your opinions, while they may be good and while they may be true, won't be listened to because they're just gonna be lumped in with the cacophony of everything else that happens, which is unfortunate, but does happen. Now, when you go into being writing, so what we talked about before was a lot of kind of having one-on-one -on -one conversations with your, uh, with your coworkers. But it also applies to uh, written emails too, because that's going to govern a lot of communication, especially now in you know these uh, this pandemic. Very often you're going to be communicating through email, or if you have multi-site locations, it's going to be through email. When you communicate through email, you want to make sure that you're very concise, but you don't want to be too concise to the point where it sounds like you know you're upset. Think of like text messaging. There's a way of typing uh, your your responses to convey a sense of uh, annoyance or conveying a sense of understanding. So you want to use just a, just enough in your communication so that we don't drag on and on. But you want you don't want to just send one word answers and be terse about things. One thing that's also important is when you are writing reports, make sure that people want them. I know I've seen several times where folks will write beautifully detailed and almost complicated reports discussing an effect of something or an audit report, for instance. And by the time they get all these wonderful documents together, finish the editing, include all the figures and stuff, the organization has since moved on from the problem. And by the time the document comes out, it's old news and nobody reads it. You know, for better or for worse, remember, they probably, the organization could use to read that document, but the way in which it was conveyed those that information those findings may have been better suited in just a bullet email form to that way to, to spur the discussion or maybe shared in a forum where you're on a, a conference call perhaps that would have been a better idea than putting it in a written form because very often long detailed reports can be very difficult to get people to read them and then also to act on them because you're counting on a bunch of other people reading a document that they may or may not have time to do and you know to kind of think of that balance over communication is also just as worse as under communicating sometimes because like we kind of alluded to in the past if you're constantly sending information out to people and you're constantly trying to get them to, uh, to pay attention to something very often you'll get tuned out and that the same thing can happen if you're ending up you know sending these huge paragraphs of uh, of content, you know what I mean? TLDR is an abbreviation for a reason, right? So people look at that and respond to that 
in, in not only just in informal communication, but also in formal communication as well. So it's something to take a look and think about when you start emailing people. You don't want to, you don't want someone to have to TLDR you because that's usually a, a signal that maybe you didn't hit the mark uh, for them. Sometimes you'll be asked to do slide presentations, just like this one. You'll find uh, maybe that th these slides are a little uh, stark in, uh, in their presentation. Maybe there's not as not much information on them as you're used to. I find that that's actually a little bit more effective in that regard, because if there's too many things to look at, it can be distracting. And also, nobody really comes to a presentation to observe your fantastic PowerPoint skills. They're here to learn about your ideas. And that's the thing you want people to pay attention to. Sure, the slides can look like they're made by a designer. Of course, you don't want the slides to just be blank text on a on a on a font without anything to look at. But more often, less is more. And that's kind of a theme going through a lot of communication in the industry is that you don't want to send too much information and too much uh, things to look at. You want to be just, just even under but just enough to get the conversation to the next step. Pictures can also be nice. Uh, very often, instead of, uh, instead of explaining something, a simple photo uh, can tie up the point quite nicely. Pictures are worth a thousand words, right? So that's, uh, that I find to be also very useful as things are going. But unfortunately, uh, I've been to several conferences and several, both conferences for education, conferences in, uh, in industry and watched several pitches uh, from people trying to get funding. And I see something that looks like this. And this is kind of, this may be extreme, but this is exactly what I end up seeing. So number one, you don't want to read directly from the slide. Reading directly from the slide is annoying because not only can your audience read, oftentimes they will read before they listen to you. And if you have way too much text, they're gonna start reading the entire thing and almost drown your voice out to the point where your voice becomes annoying, which is unfortunate because when you're giving a talk, <laughs> they should be listening to you and not reading the slide that you have. Occasionally you can see stuff where there's, you know, gaudy clip art or, you know, murder by logos going on on the border of the, uh, <clears throat> on the border of the slide. That's more stuff to distract from the idea that's going on. You can have a garish color scheme that is, just over completely assaults your retinas. Um, another thing that I found that people in industry are, love to do, and it's terrible for communication, uh, are acronyms, the overuse of acronyms. So if we look at point number three there next to the nice conspicuous pointer, um, there's a, a sentence there, right? 60% of Q4 PQI hits came from something. So is that statement good or bad? Reflect it, think about this. Is that, is that good? Is that bad? Do I care? Does that have anything to do with me? There's no context there. So you kind of want to avoid these sorts of just, you know, can always contextualize the fact. Don't sway the fact, but put the fact in context of, you know, how it affects the world around it. It's a, it's a far more actionable way of presenting that information because when a fact stand on its own sometimes people have a hard time connecting with how that impacts their reality and you want to make sure that that goes on a sin of powerpoint of course is that you can make the font anything that you want and oftentimes i see people trying to smash too many things into this onto the slide so the font ends up getting very very tiny so when you end up watching this you know perhaps not on a zoom or on a uh, webinar, if this were being presented in a in an auditorium, for instance, very often you're going to start seeing people squint and trying to lean in. And if there's any sort of lighting going on, sometimes they like to dim the lights or whatever. Reading tiny font is uh, is disastrous. It requires too much work. It distracts the audience and just isn't really effective. Contrast of colors is important. So congrats if you can read that uh, fifth point. I've seen people use these fantastic uh, templates in, in PowerPoint only for either the title of the slide or the title of the graph or the color scheme of the graph and the slide to end up being either a nightmare to look at in terms of contrast or I've seen stuff where it disappears altogether, which is um, 
<laughs> not very good. The chart on the lower right hand um, is <clears throat> somewhat famous in uh, in graphing circles as being a chart that's utterly useless because not only is it too small, which I have seen, it's in 3D, so it's immediately misleading. We don't know what it's saying. There seems to be a break there on the axis on the left, uh, also on the bottom. There's some numbers there that represent something. And if you lean in in your chairs, you can see that it says structure of college enrollment, percent of total enrollment across some years. So not too sure what uh, what's going on here. It doesn't do a great job of, con of uh, conveying that information. And uh, these sorts of charts can not only hurt your eyes, but also hurt your ability to make a point. So, enough of that. <clears throat> when you give talks and when you give presentations and pitch ideas in industry, very often it's tough to tell how good you did. Um, nobody's gonna be grading you. And the only people that are really gonna probably talk to you are gonna be your colleagues. So, even if ideas are good, they won't act on them immediately. The idea that you see in you know movies where someone makes a pitch and then a large stamp comes out and they say, you know, it's a great idea and approved. So very often that doesn't happen. You may get a you know polite nod or a couple scribblings on a on a page, but you're not gonna immediately see typically any feedback from your idea or whether it's gonna be adopted or whatnot for quite some time and that can span years. I know uh, we put forward some suggestions on how to redo some testing in some of the companies that I work with that could save them, you know, over half of their budgeting costs for their laboratories with a couple redesigns and buying some new machines and putting some science to the point where everybody sort of agreed it was a no brainer, but it still took about a year and a half to get all that to go which seems, you know, pretty tough to do. Like, why does it take so long? And that's the pace organizations go when they, uh, when they make decisions, when they decide to spend money, when they allocate money, it takes a while. So it's something to get used to. Uh, <clears throat> whenever you're getting ready to give a talk, that's gonna be technical in nature. I don't recommend that you look to your colleagues for feedback on whether or not the talk is good or not. Very often they can infer the data that you're trying to communicate. So if you're trying to make a point about, say, a uh, about an experiment or about the results of something, very often they can deduce it themselves, likely because they've heard you talking about it, they've had pre prior exposure to uh, this sort of thing before, or maybe a project that they worked on looked a lot like that. In that case they can almost perceive content that isn't actually there or connections that don't actually exist. <clears throat> what you want to do is find someone that you trust and that you know is going to give you honest feedback, but has very little interaction with that content. So when they see it, you're getting it from the eyes of someone who just basically walked in the room and saw the ideas that you're going to talk about or heard uh, the information that uh, you're going to be conveying and they can give you a really good idea about how accessible that content is, what they can do about it, is the information clear, are the conclusions clear, stuff like that. So <clears throat> when you do sorts of things you need to make sure that, you're, uh, that your conclusions are easily grasped so that if, you know as the textbooks often say evident to the casual observer when you go through some ridiculous equation at the end, it's clearly it can be shown that. And what you want, what you want in your uh, in your communications is that it genuinely is evident to the casual observer, or it is very clear what you want the other person to do, or what your contribution is. It shouldn't be buried in the facts, even if there's some nuance in there. That nuance should be highlighted to the point where it makes it easy, so someone who just uh, gets a little snippet of it, can understand what the importance is and how they can rely on it. Whenever you go into the end, you want to make sure that you sub, uh, cement your contributions and conclusions. Don't leave people doubting what it is they should do or, uh, or be confused. <clears throat> At the end of meetings, oftentimes content is discussed, but follow-up uh, 
follow-up information isn't. So whenever you want to uh, to do that, at the last 15 minutes, I always recommend putting together lists of action items and who's going to do them, because very often in industry you kind of gain a consensus of yeah that should be done, but nobody knows who's doing it, who's doing what, and it doesn't end up getting done. So you don't want to do that. Always, always, always assign action items and make sure there's consensus there or some sort of agreement, even if you don't like it, on who's going to be doing what. Otherwise, the project won't move forward because it ends up being a tragedy of the commons where everybody knows about it, but nobody did anything. Whenever you finish a talk or something, you always want to give uh, people ways to contact you if they want to learn more. Uh, sometimes, especially if talks that are larger in scope, and if it's at, if it's at work, people know where you sit <clears throat> or know your email address, but in larger contexts, people may want to talk to you or may want to offer you an opportunity because of that. Always make sure how a way to get in touch with you is, is evident and is clear with what you, uh, how you end. So during the overview, we talked about uh, how to communicate. We talked about different ways of communicating. And we talked about uh, scenarios. So <clears throat> let's say that you are wanting to propose a project to get some funding to your boss. And ultimately, to really get this approved, your boss needs to go to their boss. So this is someone you've never met before. You don't know about your boss's boss. You've heard about him, but you don't really know. What do you need to show? All right. What do you need to display in order to get this approved? Don't fall into the, into the trap of explaining the technology or... Don't fall into the trap of explaining the methodology too much, just enough to get the point across. What you want to really home, uh, hit home are the effects. What is, the, what is going to change? How is it going to change? And how do you know that? Have you measured? What's the return on investment? Why should we care? How much time do we save? These sorts of things are what causes people to make actions. How it works? Mm -hmm. Enough to make it so that way they leave, they have some idea about of what goes on, but the nitty gritty or the um, intricacies of an instrument, not so much important. You really want to make sure you make it so that way your boss can advocate for the idea, assuming they agree with you, to the point where you don't need to be there. They can advocate it with their boss clearly, show those effects so that way if their boss gets questioned about it, they can do the same. Uh, clear and open communication can allow for that. So we go up one step further. Suppose you are in a boardroom meeting. So this is the <clears throat> end of your sales meeting. So all the best salesmen in your company have been pulled together to learn about new advances in their organization. It's at the top floor of the fancy hotel downtown and it lasts three days and you're just so happen to be lucky enough to get 15 minutes to explain why your contributions are so good. What do you talk about? Do you talk about the advances in science? Good. Do you talk about a uh, new technique you discovered? Could. Wouldn't recommend it. I would instead would give, in this context of a sales team, give them things that they can tell their customers. Because if you're commuting to a sales staff, <clears throat> very often they're not going to be talking about methods or or ways to do something, they need to know why their product is superior and how it'll work for their end user. So talk about what new ways you found to measure these impacts. Talk about new ways of shortening that lead time of saying, you know, we found this new technology, it's more robust than the competition because this reason, or make the, make the ideas encapsulated so that way very often the salesperson isn't going to really understand all the science, nor do they have to. They will, however, need to convey some of that value to the end customer, who will then talk and turn to their scientists and say, does this really make sense? Make them go away. So that way it's like a, like a movie or something where they get one idea and they can go talk about it. That's what 
would lead you to a more successful uh, boardroom meeting. And then we can also talk about larger audiences. So now uh, if you're starting to give uh, <clears throat> talks at conferences, you're giving webinars, all the same ideas apply. Increase the accessibility of your content. And, and what I mean by that is make sure that when you start presenting ideas, it's something that's evident to the casual observer, something that someone can walk up, read a little bit, and say, yeah, that makes sense. And, oh, that's interesting. Learn a couple of the points and walk away with that. That's way more effective than trying to make a bunch of uh, a bunch of technical points to the point where you have contributions, slides with 15 different things on them to try and get across to an audience in 10 minutes. It's not going to happen. <clears throat> it's not going to go well. And you're better off being a little bit shorter. So these uh, ideas and these contributions are uh, are important. You want to make sure that you uh, understand your audience before you go out and start communicating with people. It'll lead you to better uh, better prospects. So kind of in sum, <clears throat> with uh, effective communication, you can make sure that all parties can get the information they need and they can use that to go the entire distance on a project. And by listening, keeping the needs in mind, you can facilitate that exchange of information easier. And then by doing so, that elevates your position in the company because you're someone who can make things happen because you can make people work together easier, which is always more important. Always make sure that your information is accessible and that it's uh, in, con in congruence with where the company wants to go, what the projects are working on, make that connection very easy to see so they can keep going. And that'll make sure that your contributions are valued. So I invite all of you to, uh, I love hearing your questions. I, I love answering them. And uh, if you want more, go ahead and find me on LinkedIn. You can follow me, connect with me. I, I welcome questions. So <clears throat> please, as we kind of as we come in for a landing here, apologies if you can hear some uh, traffic noise. Please, uh, please ask away. Don't be shy because uh, chances are somebody else has a question very similar to yours uh, as well. So it was fun talking with you guys. So. Look forward to hearing yeah, from great. Uh, yes, thank you, Marciano. I really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, we do have a few questions coming in, and, and as Marciano said, now is the time for you to type in your questions. Um, anything you want to discuss, we're going to lead a Q and A now in 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 the next uh, twenty minutes or so of the of the presentation. So um, I guess one of the first questions um, is. Uh, so a lot of the folks on this call are probably graduate students uh, and early career scientists, maybe some undergraduates on this call. And, you know, they may be wondering, you, you want to be able to build these communication skills if you're planning on going for a career in industry. Can you give some advice on how they might practice building these communication skills as graduate students? I mean, as, as you said, Understanding audience is really important, but often if they're giving a presentation at, say, a meeting, that's a scientific presentation. Are there mm -hmm. ways they can practice the kind of communication that will help them in an industry setting as grad students? What's your advice? I would say start thinking about uh, how you introduce yourself to parties. Uh, as as uh, off the cuff as that may seem, very often when these uh, when these large organizational uh, meetings happen. It's often in a more of a social setting. So yeah, you'll give a 15 minute uh, conversation, but the action and cooperation happens during a more of a socializing event. So knowing how you present your ideas and how you present your contributions in those kind of small, uh, small interactions, not quite an elevator pitch, you know, nothing as formal as that, but uh, kind of think about, so like, uh, let's use the, uh, a bio statement, you know what I mean? I could sit here and tell you <clears throat> that I was, you know, a physicist, and then I, I worked in a laboratory, and then I did a bunch of stuff going over being a consultant, and then we did, you know, got partnerships with the European Union. But immediately, you're already starting to disengage from the conversation. Instead, I can say something like, "Well, I'm a scientist, but I also love working with people." Well, immediately, that's something someone can understand. I like making making projects come together. Thinking about those kind of truncated statements and saying, what is your contribution? 
uh, I would say that, and then you can practice it with people you meet at uh, in social instances, which are totally not happening now because of COVID. But as you uh, as you get through uh, kind of those ideas, it's important to important to talk with people and network outside of the outside of your bubble because it can show you those shortcomings. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, no, I think that's really good advice. And of course, you know, I often will give advice about networking at APS APS meetings, but even then, right, you're 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 already dealing with a very self-selected audience. So as you said, completely random, like practice talking to people on again, not right now, but planes, at the grocery store, um, mm -hmm. all kinds of different settings where you're you're specifically not talking to somebody who is a physicist or knows even necessarily what a physicist is. So absolutely that's good advice. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one question that came in is, you know, you you talked about these different scenarios where it's like your your boss's boss, um, and and the question is, how is it really that often that your manager is going to be presenting your work in these settings? Like, how often does that happen? Depends on the size of the organization, but the larger it is, the more common that will be. <clears throat> Especially if you're tr trying to present to offsite management. So to delve into those examples a little bit more. Uh, when I would do localization work in Japan, uh, the ideas that I would have would need to be approved in Japan, right? So those now, folks- up, can, I, can I interrupt you? Can you define what localization work means? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so um, I worked for a company here in Akron, Ohio, and we were building an expansion onto our facility for product lines that are originally happening and being produced uh, in Japan and in Thailand. We wanted to bring that production into the United States. So what we would have to do is I would go over, see how those product lines work, understand the, the science, understand the manufacturing, understand the testing, take all those notes down, and this would last anywhere from two weeks to about a month, and then bring those ideas over and think about how to plan that plant how to run that facility in the United States. And very often, you didn't get to the real nitty gritty of it while you were there, because while you were on the ground in the, other, uh, in the other country, this was the first time you were seeing a lot of stuff. So these questions and these, uh, <clears throat> these, these solutions that you would see to your problems would come to your mind as you were working after the fact. So once that would occur, you would need to get some sort of approval on your ideas. You can't just change them willy-nilly. And when you do that, very often, if it was uh, there was a language barrier, I wouldn't be presenting in English. I would be telling my information to someone who was bilingual, who would then have to uh, articulate that information accurately, but in a different language that I couldn't do. And uh, as another example, you know, in my current role, we're governed out of out of Atlanta and this particular plant is in Columbus, Ohio. So very often <clears throat> decisions are made uh, in Atlanta amongst the uh, amongst people who are two or three tiers above where, say, I am. And when I come up with these ideas, I need to make sure that, okay, I'm going to put this in a proposal in a document, but very often this is going to be talked about at a staff meeting that I'm not here for. So it's, it's something that happens uh, definitely more so than, more so than not, but it does depend on the size of the organization. The larger it is, the more common. The smaller it is, you may be able to get away with presenting to uh, to your decision makers, which is the best uh, yourself, because then that really has to that really is what makes you better as a communicator is getting in, is trying to convince someone of the decision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, another question is, uh, can you give some specific moments that were kind of teachable moments for you? Like, you know, you came from being a physicist and going into industry. I mean, obviously, I assume there must have been a learning curve for you. Can, can you describe a situation where, you know, maybe you, you missed the mark and you had to sort of re, or how did you learn mm -hmm. uh, yourself? What, what are the most effective ways to communicate? the uh yeah so the big thing that comes up is trying is understanding the idea that data doesn't convince everybody because very often it can be so clear what the decision is and to watch people <clears throat> who never had um never did uh 
what I was doing, you know, whether that was testing in a laboratory, developing a product, watching people who had no, no experience doing that and had no idea how to do it well, make suggestions and try to, you know, make their mark on how processes need to run when the data show that that's not the case. That can get very frustrating when you combine in, you know, maybe industrial politics or this is, you know, somebody else's boss who has a lot of sway in the organization. And during those moments, data doesn't, doesn't bridge the gap. It should. It's very annoying when it doesn't. And I would used to get so angry and would constantly just smash, basically smash uh, spreadsheets in their face. Look, see? But when I did that, all that did was make people resentful because now you're implying that people are stupid and nobody likes that. And instead of building a bridge, you're burning it. And it didn't take very long to see that my audience was getting smaller because I was just the angry guy. When in reality, what you need to do is reach out, be the bridge, and say, okay, why do you think that? What What is, what is a barrier for you? And that's where that understanding where the other person is. And, and you have to work through that. That happened a lot during the during the localization idea. Where people would have ideas that were bad, <laughs> for lack of a better word. But because of their position, those ideas immediately got uh, got considered. Going back to the idea that your ability to speak and your ability to write very often can trump the um, uh, the quality of your ideas and in those instances, that's when you have to rely on, that's when those communication skills really become important because now the actual right answer is being hampered on by misconceptions, bad ideas, you know, self-serving um, actions. If and the thing that, that wins in those scenarios is a superior ability to communicate because if you can advocate for that cause, you can tell the story, you can show how robust that solution is, that's how you convince people. It's not by contradicting them or putting them in a gotcha moment. As right. satisfying as that is, it doesn't work. Yeah, well, and you often hear people talking about, you know, people's quote unquote pain points or, you know, or we also have a great webinar on value proposition, right? The idea is that you want to help the person understand how what you're offering will help them solve their problems, right? That's mm -hmm what is the audience and what is the goal, right? So, so contradicting certainly, yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't um, be of service in that scenario. Um, so we've got a couple of general questions too about uh, industry careers. And, and I wanna, again, let everybody know that we've done a lot of webinars so far about uh, industry careers. The first one in the series, Success in Industry Careers that I did, gets at a lot of these very specific questions. So we've got a question about compiling resumes. We've got a question about doing a job search uh, and networking for that. So um, I can say a couple quick things. And Marciano, if you want to add on to that, you certainly can. But sure. I, I would welcome that. Um, but I also just want to make sure people know that if you if you go back and look at some of the other things that are in the Success in Industry Careers webinar series, you'll get pretty uh, thorough answers to some of these questions. But um, one of the questions was about uh, a resume. And so what my, the advice that I always give for industry careers, it, it is a very similar thing to what you said. I recommend that folks use basically a one-page skills-based resume if they're going to be applying for industry jobs. And a lot of people, the mistake they make is that they, they, they submit the CV and it does everything that you're talking about. It, it has all this extraneous information. It has all this stuff that's not actually relevant to the job description. Whoever is reading it, who is probably not the scientists or whoever you're going to be working with, it's someone in HR who's just trying to call out the 80% of uh, applications that are not relevant. They're going to see all this, you know, stuff on this page, and they're not going to. You don't want to have to make them work to see why you're the right person for the job. So you want to actually have your resume be a function of the job description. You literally should be willing to write a separate resume for every single job description, and it should fit like a key into a lock. You know, you should every skill that they ask for in that job description should appear in the words they use on that one page skills based resume. And I do have a tutorial that I can send out that shows 
how you take a CV and convert it to a skills skills resume. But Marciano, do you have any additional advice? I do. I do. Uh, so to kind of peek behind the curtain, right? I've hired um, I've hired scientists out of out of their undergraduate. I've hired graduate level uh, scientists, and to kind of paint that picture, I have my day, right? Where I'm I'm doing all the things that I have to do, whether it's the localization work, continuous improvement, meetings with people, international phone calls, and then one of my people quits. Uh oh, I have a hole now. All of us have to do their work, so I'm already more busy. Then we post the post that job on the job board, and uh, this is an actual example. 250 people apply. That's great. I do not have I do not have the time to go through 250 resumes. It doesn't happen. However, HR starts filtering people, right? So they either apply that text filter, or they you know do their own kind of self assessment there. And then they'll go out and field phone calls and they'll start doing phone interviews. I've never met these people yet. So this entire process is happening well before I ever see anything. And then after however long that takes, and that's including me sending, you know, a weekly, you know, poke at HR saying, is it going well? Yeah, it's going well. Okay, doing phone interviews? Yeah, we're doing phone interviews. Okay, that's good to know. And eventually it comes to here's 10 people we think that would be working. So now now I've seen it. So out of those 250, 10 made it to that step. So that whole part, generally, the scientist didn't see it <laughs> at all. So that's a problem. And if you're trying to go through this from you know the other side and you're saying, well, I have to make a resume for every single post, but I need to make a lot of posts because I need a job and I got bills to pay. Uh, what I would recommend to you is to go on your favorite job board, whether that's Indeed or LinkedIn or, or whatever it ends up being. Take a general stab at what it is that you want to do. I want to be uh, you know, a physicist. I want to be a quality person. I want to be a safety person, whatever. Type that in and gather a relevant sample size of the job postings that you want, that you think, yeah, that's the job I want. And get like like a lot, like 20 or 30 of these, right? Put them together and then start looking for what's in common. What words do they use? What, to, how do they phrase things? What makes people in certain industries, how do they phrase it different than others? This can help if you're really coming up dry on that keyword search and nobody's pinging you on your resume and, and you have no idea what to do. Go onto the job, see, you know, basically go to the store and see how everybody's advertising their products and see, oh, they're using these words. Oh, those, everybody has used key performance indicators. Okay, I need to say how I affected a key performance indicator that checks that box, you know, and go through those ideas with um, with whatever job it is that you want to do. So it's really annoying to have to constantly critique your resume and make it different, especially if you're trying to apply for a bunch of jobs. Don't let perfection be the enemy of uh, be the en be the enemy of uh, permissible here, right? So do what you can, compile those postings find those common inlets because very often once you get the hang of it you'll get a lot more hits which is uh and you'll know when that works and when i say you'll know you'll start getting callbacks you'll start getting interviews you know what i mean use that as your barometer but if it sounds like yeah. you might as well crumple your resume and throw it out the window mm, time to have time to reassess yeah absolutely that's that's great advice and i i do want to mention that you know aps has a job board uh careers.aps.org we're actually part of a shared jobs database with um, not just Physics Today, but IEEE Computing, American Vacuum Society, and uh, many, many other societies. So there's actually a, a large number of industry jobs that are specifically hiring physicists. So like, yeah, you can look on Indeed and you can look at, at other, other places, but one nice thing about the APS job board is these employers are specifically targeting people with physics degrees. So um, I highly recommend, I'll put the, the URL in the chat as well, but check out the, the job board. But Marciano, I really like your suggestion to actually study, right? This is something that we're good at as physicists as we can study and learn. Um, when I look through those job postings, I see certain things come up all the time. And in fact, in every single industry job uh, posting I've ever seen, teamwork and communication skills are, are in every single one I've seen, no matter what the job, no matter what the industry, no matter what the company, 
and actually no matter what the degree path, right? Whether it's bachelor's, master's, or PhD. Um, I have another question about uh, networking. We know that networking is also really important. Again, I did a, I did a, and there was specifically a question about what to do during COVID. We did a yeah. webinar at the beginning of the summer that was basically about how to keep building your professional path during COVID, how to use electronic tools to keep up the, the very valuable uh, activity of networking. But Marciano, can you say, in, you know, in your opinion, first about the value of networking and how to do it effectively, particularly uh, during lockdown? Sure, just about every job that I got, I didn't apply for. There was only one job that I got that I applied through through the traditional, like, you know, click apply and do all that kind of stuff. That only happened once. All the other ones were because I knew someone that knew somebody through some, you know, degree of separation, right? It's extremely powerful. So the idea that, that um, you know, you could do, in some ways it seems like a strange trade off because you do all this stuff to make your resume look good, but then the person that knows, the, that knows somebody gets the job. So you feel like, well, that's a waste. It's not, you have to have both of those things or it helps to have both of those things. You don't have to, it helps that you do. So always look for, for ways for people to, to connect and to talk about COVID a little bit, <clears throat> nobody really had a good sense of this world until they found themselves in it. So just as you know, everybody's finding ways to network, so too are the companies finding ways to, to work together to attempt to hire people without, you know, because you're really going to bring them on site for an interview when it's this huge process. Mm, it gets cumbersome. I know we took posts down and have started putting them back up and saying, okay, well, we're interview now and they're in a room together and all this kind of stuff. So during this time, recognize that you're not the, no one's going to take it too hard on you if maybe some of this stuff slowed down during the, during the pandemic because it's, it's the pan and pandemic, right? Everybody's facing this kind of stuff, you know, and it's new for everyone, you know, these video conferencing stuff, the work at home, everybody's going through, right? Nobody has a sound studio in their, in their house to do, uh, to do webinars and things. So it, it's how the world is in this case, but it doesn't mean networking should stop. Find things, some folks are, some organizations are doing office hours. Some organizations are, you know, for their career um, mentors and whatnot. So you can meet people that way. Uh, find ways to get to be to make it interactive because sometimes the message board and stuff can get a little stale. Yeah, that would be just because right now everybody's starting trying to get a cadence of how this uh, <clears throat> stuff is working in uh, in a pandemic, but networking will continue to exist in some form or another. So just kind of keep in mind, see what your ins institution is doing if they're holding. Uh, Holding networking sessions or virtual job job fairs and things like that. Always, always try, always give it a shot. Don't be afraid of, of it not going well or whatever. You know what I mean? The first, some of the first webinars I did, the camera was facing the wrong way, or you know, it's up to here or something. So don't don't worry about uh, that stuff. You'll, you'll work it out as you do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I will also mention that uh, there was another great presentation given as part of our summer webinar series that I am again trying to find uh because i just want everyone to have access to it effective communication with online tools uh which i am also just dropping into the chat but uh peter fisk gives a great presentation on how how to actually use online tools effectively um so yeah hopefully y'all will find some of this these resources helpful explore our webinar page we've done something like 40 webinars since may and they're all on different career and professional development related topics, largely uh, focused on industry, but certainly other things. So please check that out. Um, so unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for our webinar. We do apologize. There are some questions I did not get to, um, but you could certainly follow up with us if you want. You can send an email to webinars at APS.org and we can forward um, the questions. There was a question about the video recording. Yes, this has been recorded and we will be sending you the recording via email uh, in two days time. Uh, so look out for that email from GoToWebinar. It'll contain the link to the recording. Lastly, I also want to please, uh, please take a moment uh, as you leave to fill out our survey to give us feedback on this presentation. We really value your feedback. And with that, I will say goodbye to everyone. Thank you, Marciano, again. Um, and everybody have a, have a great day.
It's great to American, be here. Yeah. <laughs> American Physical Society, copyright 2020, all rights reserved. <laughs>